The Gospel according to Luke is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and it's actually part one of a unified two-volume work, Luke Acts. If you compare the opening lines of both of these books, it's clear that they come from the same author, and there are internal clues in the book of Acts, as well as an early tradition that identifies the author as Luke, the traveling companion and co-worker of Paul the Apostle, who we know was also a doctor. Luke opens his work with a preface telling us how and why he wrote this book. He acknowledges that there's many other fine accounts of Jesus' life out there, but he wanted to go back to the eyewitness traditions of as many early disciples as he could in order to produce what he calls an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now that word fulfilled shows us why Luke wrote this account. For him, the story of Jesus isn't just ancient history. He wants to show how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant story of God in Israel, and bigger than that, of the story of God in the whole world. The book's design is fairly clear. There's a long introduction that sets up the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. Then in chapters 3 to 9, Luke presents a robust portrait of Jesus and his mission in his home region of Galilee. After that, the large midsection of the book is Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem, which leads to the story's climax, Jesus' final week in Jerusalem leading up to his death and resurrection, which then leads on into the book of Acts. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half of Luke's gospel. The extended introduction tells in parallel the birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. So you have this elderly priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then this young unmarried woman, Mary and Joseph. They both receive an unlikely divine promise that they're going to have a son. Both promises are fulfilled then, as John and then Jesus are born, and both parents sing poems of celebration. Now these poetic songs, they're filled with echoes from the Old Testament Psalms and prophets, showing how these children will fulfill God's ancient promises. But these poems also preview each child's role in the story to follow. So John is the prophetic messenger promised in the Torah and the prophets who's going to prepare Israel to meet their God. And Jesus, he's the messianic king promised to David, who's going to bring God's reign over Israel and God's blessing to the nations, just like he promised to Abraham. After this, Mary brings Jesus to the Jerusalem temple for his dedication, and two elderly prophets, Anna and Simeon, they see Jesus and they recognize who he is. And Simeon sings his own song, a poem inspired by the prophet Isaiah. He says, this child is God's salvation for Israel, and he will become a light to the nations. So with all this anticipation, the story moves forward into the next main section, where Luke presents Jesus and his mission. He sets the stage with John's renewal movement at the Jordan River, where he's calling a new, repentant, recommitted Israel into existence through baptism. He's preparing for the arrival of God's kingdom. And then Jesus appears as the leader of this new Israel, and he's marked out by the Spirit and the voice of God from heaven. He is the beloved Son of God. After this, Luke follows with the genealogy, and it traces Jesus' origins back to David, then back to Abraham, and then all the way back to Adam from the book of Genesis. Luke's claiming here that Jesus is the messianic king of Israel who will bring God's blessing, but not only to Israel, the family of Abraham. He is here for all the sons of Adam, for all humanity. After this, Luke has strategically placed the story of Jesus going to his hometown, Nazareth, where he launches his public mission. At a synagogue gathering, Jesus stands up and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners, new sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. Now, along with the other Gospels, Jesus is presented here. He's the Messianic King bringing the good news of God's kingdom. But what Luke uniquely highlights are the social implications of Jesus' mission. So he brings freedom. The Greek word is aphasis. It literally means release, and it refers to the ancient Jewish practice of the year of Jubilee described in Leviticus 25. It's when all Israelite slaves were released, when people's debts were canceled, when land that was sold is returned back to families. It's all a symbolic reenactment of God's liberating justice and mercy. And then Jesus says that this good news of release is specifically for the poor. Now, in the Old Testament, the poor, or in Hebrew, ani, it's a much broader category than just people who don't have very much money. It refers also to people of low social status in their culture, like people with disabilities or women and children and the elderly. 
It also can include social outsiders, like people of other ethnic groups, or people whose poor life choices have placed them outside acceptable religious circles. And Jesus says that God's kingdom is especially good news for these people. So after this, Luke immediately puts in front of us a large block of stories, showing us what Jesus' good news for the poor looks like. It involves the healing of a bedridden sick woman, or a man who has a skin disease, or someone who's paralyzed. There are stories here also about Jesus welcoming into his community a tax collector, like Levi, who's not financially poor, but he is a social outsider. There's a story about Jesus forgiving a prostitute. Luke's showing us how Jesus' kingdom brought restoration and reversal of people's whole life circumstances. He's expanding the circle of people who get invited in to discover the healing power of God's kingdom. And as Jesus' mission attracts a large following, he does something even more provocative. He forms these people into a new Israel by appointing over them the 12 disciples as leaders corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jesus teaches his manifesto of an upside-down kingdom, or as Luke calls it, the sermon given on the plain. He says God's love for the outsider and the poor means that his kingdom brings a reversal of all of our value systems. He is here to form a new alternative people of God who are going to respond to Jesus' invitation by practicing radical generosity, by serving the poor. People who are going to lead by serving and live by peacemaking and forgiveness. People who are deeply pious but who reject religious hypocrisy. Now, Jesus' radical kingdom vision, his claim to divine authority, it starts to generate resistance and controversy, especially from Israel's religious leaders. His outreach to questionable people, it's a threat to their religious traditions and their sense of social stability. And so they start accusing Jesus of blaspheming God, of being a drunk and mixing with sinners. And so this section culminates in a new revelation of Jesus' mission to his disciples. He says that Yes, he is the messianic king, and that he's going to assert his reign over Israel by dying in Jerusalem, by becoming the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53, who dies for the sins of Israel. And then the shocking idea, it gets explored in the next story, as Jesus goes up a mountain with three of his disciples, and he's suddenly transformed in front of them. They're enveloped in this cloud of God's presence, who announces, this is my chosen son. And then Moses and Elijah are there, the two other prophets who encountered God's presence and voice on a mountain. And Luke tells us that they're talking together about Jesus' exodus that he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now that Greek word exodus, it's a clear reference to the exodus story. Luke is portraying Jesus here as a new Moses who will lead his newly formed Israel into freedom and release from the tyranny of sin and evil in all of its forms, personal, spiritual, and social. And that's going to lead us into the second half of the book. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel according to Luke. Route 66. Today we continue our journey through the Bible from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. We're cruising through these 66 books, generally one book each Sunday. And this morning we are ready to study the book of Luke. And due to its length, we're dividing it into two parts. Today we're focusing on the first nine chapters. And so let's just dive right on in, beginning with the structure. How does the book of Luke fit into the overall structure of the New Testament? Well, as we've noted, there are 27 books in the New Testament divided into three main sections, five books of history, 13 letters from the Apostle Paul, which are divided between letters written to churches and letters written to pastors, and then nine general letters, mostly written by Jesus' half-brothers James and Jude and the Apostles Peter and John. Chronologically, The storyline of the New Testament is carried on by the first five books. The four Gospels tell us the story of Jesus, and then the one book of Acts, the story of the early church. Luke is the 42nd book overall in the Bible. It's the third of 27 books, the third historical book, the third of the four Gospels telling us about Jesus' life and ministry. The earliest title given to this Gospel is Katalukan. Greek meaning simply according to Luke, and so this third gospel is authored by Luke. Paul referred to him as our dear friend Luke the doctor. 
Early historical traditions, in fact, tell us that he was a personal physician and indentured servant at one time to a noble Roman family who lived in Syrian Antioch. And at some point, he was set free and given his Roman citizenship. And then after becoming a Christian, we assume in the strong church there in Antioch, as indicated by the we narratives in the book of Acts, he was a close associate and traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. During his second Roman imprisonment, Paul wrote, Only Luke is with me, evidence of Luke's loyalty to the Apostle in the face of profound danger. Tradition, by the way, also tells us that Luke remained unmarried all of his life, devoted to the Lord, and died at the ripe old age of 84. But whatever the case, Luke, we need to note, is the only Gentile contributor to the New Testament. Interesting. It's evident from the prologues to Luke and Acts that Luke wrote both volumes to Theophilus, who was a man of high social standing. In fact, some have suggested that he was the head of the noble Roman family that Luke once served as a personal physician. Luke writes, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And then, in similar style, Luke writes in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, In my former book, the book of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And so, both of these books are tied together. Luke, the story of Jesus, and Acts, the story of the church, were written by Luke to Theophilus, interesting name, literally means lover of God. In fact, in the first century, both volumes often, as we saw in the video, circulated together among the churches and were called simply Luke-Acts. Now notice that Luke writes, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. He himself was not an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Jesus, but he had access to those who from the first were eyewitnesses. And Luke's goal in writing his gospel was to write an orderly account. And so it should be no surprise to us that the gospel of Luke is the most comprehensive of the four gospels. His emphasis is on chronological and historical accuracy, and as such, it is the longest and the most literary of the gospels. With that overall structure in mind then, let's move on to the story. Once again, we're deeply indebted to the Bible Project for their excellent overview of the storyline of Luke 1 through 9 and the video clip that we watched to begin today's lesson. And as usual, I have reproduced the Luke chart across the inside pages of your notes for further study at home. In our last lesson, you might recall the key phrase in Mark is, Son of God emphasizing the deity of Jesus. In contrast, the key phrase in Luke is son of man, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. The term is used no less than 25 times throughout this gospel. Luke's point is to make sure that his readers understand that Almighty God humbled himself to take on human flesh. The Creator became one of us, His creation, to love, serve, and redeem us. We see in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus indeed understands what it means to be human. He got hungry and thirsty. He laughed and wept. He rejoiced and grieved. He interacted with the rich and religious as well as the poor and outcast. He was loved and adored as well as hated and killed. And even though 100% God, he willingly chose to become 100% human so that it was possible for him to die, to pay the penalty for our sin, and to reconcile us back to God so that we could enjoy his fellowship forever. Son of man. 
For my own understanding, I see the outline of the Gospel of Luke in four distinct sections. The preparation for the Son of Man, the power in the Son of Man, the preaching of the Son of Man, and the passion of the Son of Man. We'll cover just the first two of these in today's lesson. Let's begin with the preparation for the Son of Man. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, verse 13. Luke places a very strong emphasis on the ancestry, birth, and early years of the Son of Man. After his prologue, he then intertwines the birth stories of John the Baptist, the forerunner and cousin of the Messiah, and Jesus, the Messiah himself. Luke records their birth announcements by the angel Gabriel, their actual births, and their presentations in the temple. And then we are told an interesting little story of Jesus' encounter with the Jewish religious leaders in the temple when he was only 12 years old. When his mother Mary confronted him, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you, Jesus rather matter-of-factly responds, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? He understood at that early age. And yet he went back home and lived. Luke sums up his first 30 years of Jesus' life, his preparation for his three-plus years of ministry with these words in Luke 2 and verse 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There's 30 years summarized in one verse. Chapter 3 begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, Jesus himself is baptized in the middle of this chapter, and then Luke re- devotes the remainder of chapter 3 to the genealogy of Jesus, which we usually skip. <laughs> I want to say here, though, that Matthew's genealogy is viewed through Jesus' mother, Mary, and traces the Messiah's lineage back to Abraham. Luke's genealogy is viewed through Jesus' earthly stepfather, Joseph, and traces the Messiah's lineage back beyond Abraham all the way to Adam. Why? Because again, understand, Luke's emphasis is on Jesus being the son of man, Adam. That's the same word. Chapter 4 begins, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And then the following 11 verses tell us in detail about Jesus' temptations and his face-to-face encounter with Satan. And that concludes then the first section, the preparation for the Son of Man, which transitions into the next section, which is the power in the Son of Man. That's all right. The power in the Son of Man. The second section of Luke's Gospel emphasizes The Son of Man's authority. Luke wants to point out here to us that he demonstrates authority, Jesus does, in every realm. And he does this by focusing on Jesus' works, what he did, sprinkling of Jesus' words, what he said. After he's rejected in his hometown Nazareth, chapter 4 tells us the story of Jesus driving out an impure spirit in the synagogue in Capernaum, followed by the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And then we read in verses 41 and 42, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people. Chapter 5 begins with Jesus calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John his first apostles. But even that story is interwoven around Jesus' miracle of allowing these fishermen to catch such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Again, I want us to understand it's about the power and the authority of Jesus. And that power and authority is demonstrated yet again as the story continues in chapter 5. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. He forgives and heals a paralyzed man. Yes, Jesus has the power to forgive. Then chapter 5 closes and chapter 6 opens with Jesus demonstrating his power and authority over the Jewish religious leaders' traditions regarding fasting and the observance of the Sabbath, even as he heals a man in the synagogue whose right hand was shriveled. After officially choosing his 12 apostles, the balance of chapter 6 is some of Jesus' teaching, the Beatitudes, the love for enemies, judging other, a tree and his fruit, wise and foolish builders, and so on. Chapter 7 
is then more demonstrations of Jesus' power and authority. He heals a Roman centurion servant. He raises the widow of Nain's son from the dead. After paying tribute to John the Baptist, the chapter ends with the story of the sinful woman anointing Jesus with an alabaster jar of perfume and her tears, which, time out just a minute, that's where we get our alabaster boxes from. But Luke adds an addendum to this story that's not told in the other Gospels. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Again, Jesus even has the power and the authority to forgive sins. Chapter 8 begins with a little more of Jesus' teaching, the parable of the sower, the lamp on the stand. But then Luke quickly returns again to demonstrations of Jesus' power. He calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee. He restores a demon-possessed man. He heals a woman with an issue of blood. And he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Again, it's all about the power and the authority of Jesus, the Son of Man. Chapter 9 begins with Jesus sending out the 12, then he feeds the 5,000. After Peter proclaims him to be God's Messiah, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. Then he goes up on the mountain, as you saw in the video, with his inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. He is transfigured before them, and Moses, representing the law, and Elijah, representing the prophets. Then God announces, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Good advice. Listen to him. The next day, Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. The second section of Luke's gospel ends with Jesus predicting his death and resurrection once again. Again, it's all about the power and the authority of the Son of God, Jesus. So it's the preparation for the Son of Man and the power in the Son of Man. That's the first two sections of Luke's Gospel, chapters 1 through verse 50 of chapter 9. We'll pick it up at that point in part 2 of Luke in our next lessons. We take a closer look at the preaching from the Son of Man and the passion of the Son of Man. But for today, that's the story of Luke chapters 1 through 9, which brings us then to the Savior. Each Sunday as we focus on one of the 66 books of the Bible, one of our priorities is to point out where and how Jesus is to be found in the narrative of that book. Again, please remember, as I say every week, there's one grand central theme that runs through all 66 books of the Bible, from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation, and that is salvation through God's Son. Jesus Christ. And so here in Luke 1 through 9, we want to stop, look, and listen for the Savior. Where and how does Jesus Christ appear in this first part of the book of Luke? Well, of course, the entire gospel is all about the Savior. As the Son of Man, uh, Jesus is clearly presented by Luke as the Savior of all humankind, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, no one is left out of God's plan of redemption. The angel Gabriel told Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus, which by the way, the name literally means Savior or Deliverer. Upon the naming of John the Baptist, his father Zachariah's tongue was loosed and he prophesied about his son and then about Jesus. For you, John, will go on before the Lord, Jesus, to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Savior. On the night of Jesus' birth, the angel announced to the shepherds near Bethlehem, we've got to read these verses out loud together. Would you read them with me? I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. When Jesus was presented in the temple, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. When Jesus returned to the synagogue in his own hometown Nazareth, he read from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then the interesting thing is Jesus sat down and He looked at those He had just read that Scripture to and He said, Today, the Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And on and on and on we could go with Luke's clear presentation of Jesus as the Son of Man, the Savior. In Jesus' own words recorded in Luke 5 and verse 24, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And only He could say that because He's the Savior, the Son of Man, Jesus. Which brings us to our final point, and that is the sense. As we wrap up every lesson, I want to offer the sense of each of these books of the Bible. In other words, what practical take-home lessons can we apply to our daily lives from this book? In today's case, what instructions or applications can we glean from the book of Luke? Well, earlier, I had you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. I hope you turn there because I want you to follow along now as I read just a few key verses here. As I was thinking about what to share from these first nine chapters, this is the scripture that jumped out to me because I think it says it all. Luke chapter 6, we pick it up with verse 46. Follow along in your Bible. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, so that we get the full impact of this parable of the wise and foolish builders, I'd like to also read the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 7. So turn in your Bible, would you? Flip back a few to the first gospel, Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 24 through 27. It's on page 1510 if you're using one of our pew Bibles. But I wanted us to get Matthew's record of this very same parable that Jesus teaches and um, it's just worded a little bit differently, and I think it'll help us to understand the full thing. Matthew 7, we pick it up with verse 24. Therefore, any, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, as we introduce these parables, I don't want us to miss the question that Jesus asked in Luke 6 and verse 46, because this sets it all up. In fact, let's read this out loud together. Would you read it with me? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? The Living Bible paraphrases it. So why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? The message puts it this way. Why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing a thing I tell you? Perhaps more than any other question that Jesus asked, this question gets to the heart of our relationship with Him. This parable of the wise and foolish builders is how we should respond to who Jesus is and what Jesus taught. And I see three practical truths that we can apply to our lives from this parable this morning. First of all, I see here a lesson about obedience. It's obvious that the main difference between the wise builder and the foolish builder in Jesus' parable is obedience. The wise builder, Jesus says, hears my words and puts them into practice. The foolish builder, Jesus says, hears my words and does not put them 
into practice. Simply put, Jesus is challenging us to do something in response to his teaching, to act upon his words, to apply his instruction to our lives, to put into practice what we learn from him. It is a lesson about obedience. Now putting this into context, this is especially significant since these verses in Luke chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 7 immediately follow what? Anybody? The Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> As Jesus concludes the longest and perhaps the most noteworthy sermon of his entire ministry, he wraps it all up with this parable challenging us to be practitioners. And his question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's Jesus' invitation to him, if you will. This is his altar call. This is where Jesus challenges the audience to step up and to take responsibility. It is a lesson about obedience. Now, don't miss this. Look up here for a minute. <laughs> it was not disobedience. That marked the foolish builder. It was a lack of obedience. And there's a big difference between those two. Disobedience, you see, implies rebellion and defiance. It's shaking our fist at Jesus and saying, No, I refuse to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. But lack of obedience simply implies a failure to act. Indifference. Procrastination, forgetting to put it into practice, listening without doing. You see the difference? I say this because I doubt that there's anyone here this morning who would purposefully and defiantly disobey God. But could there possibly be some of us who lack obedience? James 1, verses 22 through 25 sums it up like this. Do not deceive yourselves by just listening to His Word. Instead, put it into practice. If you listen to the Word but do not put it into practice, you're like people who look into a mirror and see themselves as they are. They take a good look at themselves and then go away and at once forget what they look like. But if you look closely into the perfect law that sets people free and keep on paying attention to it and do not simply listen and then forget it, but put it into practice, you will be blessed by God in what you do. So first, Jesus teaches us a lesson about obedience. Second, I see here a lesson about diligence. It's clear from the parable that the major difference between the wise man's house and the foolish man's house is diligence. The wise man, Jesus says, dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. The foolish builder, Jesus says, built a house on ground without a foundation. In fact, Matthew's account simply says, built his house on sand. <laughs> and so the wise man's house had a solid foundation, but the foolish man's house had little or no foundation. And don't miss this. The difference was determined by the builders. The wise builder was diligent, but the foolish builder was negligent. And so Jesus is challenging us to be diligent in our relationship with Him, to pay the price to deepen our walk with Him, to spare no effort in doing anything and everything we can to strengthen the foundation of our faith. It's a lesson about diligence. And the point is, we are the builders. And the houses that we're building are our very own lives. And we have a choice of foundations upon which to build, either rock or sand. The solid rock is Jesus and our relationship with Him. The shifting sand is the world and our relationship with it. To build our lives on the rock is the hard way, the difficult way, the small and narrow way. To build our lives on the sand is the easy way, the convenient way, the wide and broad way. To build our lives on the rock requires that Jesus be first in our lives before and above anything and anyone else. To build our lives on the sand means the things of the world are first and foremost in our lives. To build our lives on the rock demands spiritual discipline, worship, prayer, fasting, Bible study, tithing, witnessing. To build our lives on the sand doesn't demand any discipline, only neglect. 
procrastination, complacency, <sighs> apathy, drift, shifted into neutral, laziness. Look at what the writer of Hebrews urges us to do. In fact, let's read these verses out loud together. Would you read them with me? Grow up in Christ. The foundational truths are in place, but there's so much more. Let's get on with it. Amen. Now I want each of you to extend that same diligent intensity and keep at it until the finish. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with a committed faith. So second, Jesus teaches us a lesson about diligence. And third, I see here a lesson about perseverance. The noticeable difference between what happened to the wise man's house and the foolish man's house in this parable has to do with perseverance. When the storm hit the wise builder's house, Jesus says, it could not shake it because it was well built. When the storm hit the foolish builder's house, Jesus says, it collapsed and its destruction was Complete. Matthew says that when the water and winds beat against the wise person's house, it did not fall. But Matthew says when the water and winds beat against the foolish person's house, it fell with a great crash. In other words, Jesus is challenging us to take measures so that we can stand up against the storms of life. To remain steadfast in the face of those things that threaten to destroy our faith. To demonstrate fortitude when life's difficulties overwhelm us. It's a lesson about perseverance. Now there are a couple of observations that I think we should make about perseverance. First, the storms of life will come. <laughs> our faith in God will be tested. It's not if, it's when. <laughs> and... Sometimes more than once we get tested. And secondly, I want to observe that our ability to persevere will be determined by how well we apply the first two lessons. Now think this through with me for just a moment. If we are obedient, and if we are diligent, then when the storms of life come, we will persevere. Obedience plus diligence equals perseverance. If we lack obedience and we're a little negligent and not very diligent in our relationship with the Lord, when the storms of life come, we will crash. But the more obedient we are and the more diligent we are about that obedience and growing deep in our relationship and laying that foundation, when the storms of life come, we're going to persevere. See how that works? Let's read these verses in James 1 out loud together. Would you read them with me? G James reminds us that the storms of life come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed. And you will find you have become persons of mature character. The individual who patiently endures is the truly happy person. For once testing is complete, he or she will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised. And so third, Jesus is teaching us here a lesson about perseverance. Three lessons from this parable of the wise and foolish builders. A lesson about obedience, putting into practice what we hear read and study, and a lesson about diligence, paying the price to go deeper in our walk with Christ, doing whatever it takes to build a solid foundation for our faith, and then a lesson about perseverance. If we obey and if we are diligent, then when the storms of life come, and they will come, we will persevere. Obedience plus diligence equals perseverance. That's the sense of this first part of the Gospel of Luke. May we put these lessons into practice in our lives as we move into this new year ahead of us. Route 66. As we're cruising through the 66 books of the Bible, today we focused on Luke chapters 1 through 9, the structure of the story, the Savior and the sense. We'll pick it up with the second part of Luke, the end of chapter 9 through chapter 24 in our next lesson next Sunday. I encourage you to read those chapters ahead of time before we get together next week. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for your word. It's always so practical for our lives. And today is an indication of that. What an amazing book the Gospel of Luke is. As it tells us of Jesus' life and his ministry, as it shows us the Son of Man, our Savior, who identified with us because he became like us. He became human in every way as we are, so that he could go to the cross in our place as the perfect sacrifice for us. Today, may we put these practical lessons of the wise and foolish builders to practice in our lives. Help us, Lord, not just to listen and walk out of here this morning and and say, well, that was a good sermon to start the new year. (laughs) But God, help us to put it into practice. Help us really to be obedient. Help us to be diligent in this coming new year to dig deep in our relationship with you. Some of us are going through the storms of life right now. And it's only possible to get through those storms because we have a solid foundation. Help us to do whatever we can to build that foundation on you, Jesus. You are the rock You are the one who is the anchor for our very souls. We praise you and give you all the glory and honor as we talked about all day today. You are worthy. There is no other but you and you alone, Lord Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen.